Tennessee, Auburn, Georgia. It's all in the fourth quarter. Crimson Tide announcer and our host for the Legends of Alabama football, Eli Gold. Now we began the first segment with an invocation. We'll begin this final segment with a word from the Reverend Stabler, who wants to talk about Deputy Dog. <laughs> oh gosh, Deputy Dog. Uh, when I was uh, staying at uh, at Bryant Hall, our Jack Rutledge course ran the the uh, Bryant Hall over there. Our guy was a guy named uh, Gary uh, Gary Gary. Uh, what's his name? White. White. Gary White. 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 Gary White. We called him we called him Deputy Dog, and he's always <laughs> <laughs> because he talked real slow. <laughs> And so we would go out at night, and we'd always run over to Columbus, Mississippi. It's only about an hour, 60 miles, go to Columbus and go to... <laughs> we'd go to a place over there called the Southern Air, and they had a guy singing named Big Ben Atkins. And we'd go over there and chase the girls at MSCW and go over there and listen to Big Ben Atkins and then try to make it back for curfew. And sometimes we were kind of late for that. And, G and Gary White would be waiting for us, and he'd be hiding behind the door, hiding in the john, hiding in the closet, trying to catch us. <laughs> and we got caught one day, come, one night coming back through there. We were with a guy named uh, Bunk Harpole. Bunk Harpole, we called him Head, Head Harpole, because he wore a size nine helmet. I mean, he had a big, <laughs> had a big old helmet, and only guy that I've ever seen that would mix Yahoo and vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Yahoo, <laughs> Yahoo and vodka, and he caught him crawling down the hall, trying to get to the John, crawling down the side of the wall in the dorm there, and there's Deputy Dog standing. He steps out behind the John, he says, okay, Holman, Stabler, Harpo, meet me at the practice field at 5 a.m. tomorrow. I ran more laps at 5 a.m. with Gary White than I did with Coach Bryant for three years. <laughs> Every night he had somebody, if you didn't empty your garbage can, didn't make up your bed, late for training table, whatever, there was Deputy Dog. Stabler, come with me. <laughs> so that, that's our invocation. <laughs> and I room with a boy named Jim Croft. And uh, Jim was kind of a crazy guy. And one night he, we went to party and, and we came in, it was his birthday. And his dad, Jim's daddy was rich. I mean, he had more money than God. And, uh, but for his birthday present, his daddy gave him an alarm clock. And uh, Jim was hoping for a new car, so he was a little disappointed. <laughs> so he went down to Frank's down by the railroad track and celebrated his birthday and came back. And uh, Gary, Gary kind of, you know, looked at us and gave us a hard time. And, well, the reason he did it is because Jim pulled out a 357 and shot that clock, killed it. And uh, so Gary came running up wondering what it was. And so uh, Jim says, don't you come back here. And he's sitting there and he's playing with his clock. He said, don't come back in this room without ever knocking again. He says, see this wire? I said, I want to cut that to the doorknob. I'm going to put that one on the carpet. He says, you'll never know when it's attached. I'll electrocute you. And so he, <laughs> every night, Jim would pour water on the carpet, and we never had Deputy Dog come in our room again. <laughs> Leroy, you weren't party to any of this stuff. No, I was just... never late for care for you or any of those things. <laughs> and, uh, always on time. Okay, and the truth is? The, the, the truth is, uh, yeah, I was I was one of the guys that was out there helping Debbie the dog get the guys in. You know, <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, Gary drafted me in that position to help get guys in on them and or help get the guys in that couldn't make it in. So, and I was pretty good at that. You know, we've been bragging on so many guys here today. How how good was this man, right here? You talk well, about great football player. I mean, well, that's... Coach Bryant said if, uh, it's the famous saying, if they stay between the sidelines, Leroy will make the tackle. Yeah. <laughs> so he got 31 I... tackles. <laughs> I told him that wasn't true anymore. Eddie Vesperelli though. don't believe it, though. <laughs> that's what Ed he doesn't said. believe it. Does he? No, he, he don't think... believe you got them 31 tackles. <laughs> well, my brother, my brother was keeping stats that yeah. night. So <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, but it still goes down the Orange Bowl book. You know, it's, yeah. still, it's still a record yeah. there. You know, another guy we've not talked about at all today is Pat Trammell. And now it'd be criminal to go through this whole show. Not, not, Billy, you could probably talk about, uh, about Pat. Pat, was, Pat played with uh, me and Leroy at Alabama yeah. and Jack. And he was from Scottsboro. And uh, he was probably the only guy that I knew that would uh, talk back to Coach Bryant. He would, uh, uh, he would uh, you say talk back, but I guess he would talk back to him. 
<laughs> because he would, they'd send him plays, and if Pat didn't want to run, he wouldn't run it. He'd just say, we're not going to run that. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> and you'd hear them fussing at each other, walking, coming down the sideline. Coach would be hollering at him. He'd talking back to him. And he's the only one that I know of that got away with it. But most of the time, Pat was right. Because he was a great, great football player. He's probably, we never lost a game when he started at Alabama. We lost three games, and Pat was hurt the three times we got beat. So he was a well, tremendous football tremendous player. Leader. I mean, you know, wh whatever you had to do, if it meant get a first down to, to keep the clock rolling or the chains moving or, or, you know, throw the ball out of bounds to keep him having a sack or, 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 or get the ball in the end zone running or passing, you know, whatever the heck it took, uh, uh, Pat, Pat would do it. I and saw he was some that film guy. of Pat Trammell <coughs> on, a, on a, I guess, the 61 highlight film, and he actually pitches the ball on a sweep and makes a block. 50 yards downfield against Vanderbilt, the last block for the guy to score. Leroy, and it wasn't just a block, it was a crushing block. Leroy, Pat Trammell, Pat Trammell, Coach what Bryant sent uh, Phil Cutchin. Very to talk to his, you go up there and talk to his mom and daddy and talk to the doctor. And I've already put fines in for cussing and everything. Said that, see if they can't get something done about that to parents. So Phil got in his car, state car, and went on up there to Scottsboro. And uh, he went by and knocked on the door, and Mrs. Trammell come to the door, and she said, you old son of a buck, I'm cleaning it up a little. <laughs> <laughs> what in the hell are you doing up here? He said, well, just come to visit with you and everything. He said, well, she said, you old SB, I'll see you here. So. He went to the doctor's office where his daddy was. And he asked him the same question, you know, how is everything, Phil? Well, you old son of a buck, I tell you, you ain't been up here in a long time. Now get your butt back up here sometime. So he comes back to Tuscaloosa and we're having a meeting and uh, he says, Coach, ain't nobody gonna change their vocabulary. <laughs> You talk about the relationship of the relationship with Coach Bryant to Trammell. See, Coach Bryant, when we were playing, he would eat lunch with the quarterbacks. And then on the, uh, the, the game day, the team captains that was appointed for that week would eat lunch with them too. So you know the relationship we have with Coach Bryant, you know you're not saying anything. You sit at the table, you're eating and hoping the middle will get over with in a hurry. Trammell, he just sitting there just eating. I'm the captain of the Mississippi State game this, this particular week. Trammell just eating like he just normally does. Coach Bryant reaches in like he's always doing. He'd pull out his pen and a pencil, and he'd write that, and he drew a little thing on a napkin. And Trammell never, he's just looking, kind of watching like that. Coach Bryant takes that piece of paper, slides over in front of him. And he said, Pat, what do you think about this play? I mean, Pat doesn't even, he just eating like that. He said, I don't think that'll work worth a damn. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Bryant just reached over, got that napkin, put it back in his pocket. <laughs> we kept right on going. Did you clean up the dam? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he didn't say dam. I tell you, yeah. Pat and, uh, and Jim Goostree probably the only two that really talked back to Coach, uh, Coach Bryant. And, and, and Goostree would stick up for what he believed in about a player, and no matter what the situation was. And, and Coach Bryant mostly listened. Uh, I tell you what, that was one good thing about Goose is he'd, he'd really stick up for you, and, and the coach believed him too. I heard him one time tell, tell Coach Bryant, says, you put him back in there, you're going to kill him. He says, you better not put him back in there. And Coach Bryant didn't put the guy, I forgot who it was. He didn't put him back in there. That's, uh, but Coach Goosery had an uncanny ability in that way, too. He, he, he did. He really he, did. Now he, he would. He, he's another person that would, would give his honest opinion to Coach Bryant. You gotta have folks will do that. Yeah. You do, and, and after the practice, and we'd have our dinner at the dorm over there, Super Friedman Hall. You know, uh, uh, Pat go out back with, light him up a cigar. That's the old guy we had at uh, smoke cigar and everything. Yeah, but Pat had a had a knack for that. He loved him cigar, and boy, he, he was at the back of the dorm every every evening, lighting him up a cigar. You know, he, he was really. He was really a character and, and a fun guy to be with, man. He, uh, he was a leader, but he was really, really fun to play with. Yeah. 
Let's talk about certain things that really made people proud in the studio. There's so many stories, but since this is, we're, since we're winding our way through this, we've not talked. Billy, I was, we were talking earlier, and we were discussing the Auburn games. Auburn never scored on us. That's amazing. They never scored on <laughs> you guys. One year, they, well, he, our goal was to keep them getting across their own 40 because they had a great field goal kicker, and they didn't even do that. <laughs> Unbelievable. It really makes those Auburn people mad. Uh, you know. I guess. I bring it up every day and then. Here, here. Uh, I think it was in 61 uh, when they were uh, getting down toward the goal line. They were getting to the 30 and the 20, and, and we didn't have the first team in at that particular time. So we knew if we asked Coach Bryant to go in, he probably wouldn't let us. So we got down on the end together, and when he was up back about the 50. It's 35 to nothing at the time, yeah. matter 35 fact. to nothing, and then uh, and, uh, and, uh, we hauled our ass. Well, I mean, we went back and, uh, and, and, and they didn't score, so we, we wanted to have another shutout. <laughs> How about the Illinois game for you, Jeremiah? That game probably was uh, the most emotional game I'd, I personally myself being involved in it. I reckon the reason why was because I it was my last game there at the University of Alabama, and it was Coach Bryant's last game. And I'll tell you what I, I probably remember the most is that I had a chance to share with Coach Bryant what he had did for me before the game. That's probably what meant the most to me is uh, knowing me back then, I probably didn't say four words the four years I was there. And right before the game, we were in the locker room, and I just felt an urge to, to let Coach Bryant know how I felt about him what he had did for me the four years that I was there, that I came there as a 18-year-old boy and I, I was leaving as a 22-year-old man. And to me, that's what Alabama football is, is all about as we sit around and we talk in this room uh, this afternoon is that we all came there as 18-year-old boys. And Alabama football turned us into men, men that have gone on to be successful in business and different careers. It's what, it's what we learned on the field, and I'll get back to the game here in a minute, but as I've just been sitting here, it's, and I think all of us say that's what, that's what makes Alabama football special and great that the Auburns don't have and, the, and uh, a lot of uh, different universities that we, that they, they've produced winners off of the football field that have gone on to do things in life, and it's because of uh, the game of football, and I started to realize that when I look back at the uh, team of the century, and I had a chance to receive uh, my acceptance speech, and it made me realize, man, what, what football had done for my life, you know. For one thing, uh, through the game of uh, being here, it, I was able to see a mother that was an alcoholic for over 25 years. And because of my economic situation change, uh, you know, my mom has now been sober for 19. And that's what Alabama football, it, it goes beyond just us sitting in this room. It touches, it literally touches. And, and I saw that during Coach Bryant's funeral. You know, we're riding for 60 miles, and you, it's people lying along the highway, and you're sitting there, and they're crying. They didn't know him like we did. And man, they're just, they're bawling their eyes out on, you know, on the overpasses as we were. And I'm saying, man, this is, this is bigger than I ever imagined. And so when I had a chance that last game to express to Coach Bryant, I appreciate what you've done for me, Coach. And uh, there's no way we're going to lose this game over my dead body. And uh, I wanted to be able to share with all those guys in that room, guys, we're not going to lose this game. Not the last one anyway. <coughs> Heck of a story. Uh, Heck of a story it, right there. It, it is. I, I think that, that those little words that he... Uh, taught us that we're never going to quit. You know, that, that stuck with me in business. And I had a few times in business I could have taken bankruptcy real easy because it was tough. I mean, it was hard. But somewhere there was something down deep that I said, mm, that's not the way I'm going. That way wasn't the way I was taught. And, and for the guys that didn't play on the Coast Bryant, we live. Coach Bryant lived in us through, through you all. And we're sitting talking about the, the stories about the dormitory. 
that's one thing. When I come back to the university, I pass Brian Hall, and you guys can stay in Brian Hall. But those memories and, and the thought that the kids don't have to stay in the dormitory, that closes those stories that we're sitting here telling now, those things, that's, I lived, when I walked in that dormitory, walked those halls, the same halls that the great guys before me walked, that in itself was a motivating factor to me. So those, those things there, I want that take, take that to the grave. Let and if we can do want. anything, we sure need to work on that project of getting that dorm back, no matter how it's well, divided I, 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 I can't stand the right. fact that other people living in there, no. that, that, that don't put on the crunk and the white. I can't, <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> Whatever well, we need to do, we need to help. I was going to say the same thing Canadian said. Um, we lived our life through Coach Stallings, and Coach Stallings was a great coach. He taught us a lot. And, you know, the thing that I most remember about Coach Stallings, we only had about four rules. You know, you, you know, respect your family, university, and, and of course, respect yourself. And uh, that carried a lot. You know, I, I carried that with me through the NFL. I'll forget, I'll never forget I was in Dallas in 99. <clears throat> Jerry Jones comes to me. I'm in the bathroom getting ready for a game. Jerry comes up and say, uh, hey, I got somebody looking for you. I said, man, I'm ready to play a game. Who is this? I go outside of my locker and Coach, Coach, uh, Coach Stallings is waiting on me. I'm like, what's up, Coach? He said, hey, man, I come and wish you a lot of luck. I'm over here at the game, want to watch you play. And, you know, ever since I've left the university, Coach Stallings always, you know, whether we see each other in passing, he's always asking about my family. How's the guys doing? And so, you know, I felt like through him, I'm living through, I mean, when you guys talk about Coach Bryant, Coach Stallings was our Coach Bryant, yeah. you know? That's a good point. Yeah. A good point. You know, other other big games, and uh, we would talk. You guys talk about the, the goal line stand before. Tommy, I guess what we called the, the other goal line stand. You were you were keenly involved too. Yeah, that was uh, actually the three fourteenth. Uh, that's when Coach Bryant would tie Coach Stag for the all time winning as coach, and it was at uh, Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, they actually. We're around the six or the seven yard line and we held them uh, for two downs on a third down. Uh, of course, they, they, they went away from Jeremiah and went toward Benny Perrin. And they, uh, Benny didn't even touch the guy, but they called interference. So they got the ball the first down uh, half the distance to the goal. So it pushed them inside the, the uh, five yard line to around the four. And they had four shots at it from inside the the four or five yard line. And uh, we thought, I mean, I actually thought that they were going to try and throw the ball after what had happened in the Sugar Bowl with, 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 with the other two. great yeah. goal line stand. But they had Kurt Warner. They had Sean Farrell, who was a big offensive lineman. They had a lot of All-Americans on that team, and they just figured that they could run the ball and stick it in. And we held them four straight times. And the thing that I still carry to the to this day is as we were all running off the field in, in jubilation, you know, that we had just stopped stopped him. Coach Bryant, as we the defense was coming off, he he stepped on the field, took his hat off, and tipped it at us mm -hmm. as to say, you know, a job well done. And that's something I've never ever seen him do before. And uh, so to this day, that's that's it's still a big moment as as it was to uh, Morty and Barry. Hey, Bob, I never heard this one. Who recruited you here to the... What's the story behind you getting Who recruited, recruited me? Yeah. Nobody. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I had moved to Tuscaloosa as a uh, senior in high school. And um, <clears throat> unlike a lot of you, probably unlike a, uh, most of y'all, never played ball until I, I really I moved to Tuscaloosa. And... Uh, uh, have been real fortunate that as far as being in the right place at the right time. And I think Coach Hennessy, what happened the first time you timed me? I, I fell down? What yeah, happened? you fell down. <laughs> He'd already, <laughs> already played his last game. And uh, yeah. I went over and he found that. So I walked by. I had to watch. It's, you know, I was, just had to watch. You know, you know, a sundial. But in my what, pocket. What, what ended channel. up happening is I never got recruited. That's what I had thought. Yeah, and um, never got recruited by anybody. And about three months after the season, got a call from Charlie Bradshaw, who was the defensive line coach at Vanderbilt. And he asked me to come up, and I went up there. And uh, 
uh, they offered me a scholarship and nobody else had offered me anything. So, you know, beggars can't be choosy. It's an SEC school and I like Nashville. I had a good time at Printer's Alley up there for any of y'all that been up to Nashville, but uh, called home, told my parents uh, that I was gonna sign with them. And uh, my mom said, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't do anything. Coaches from Alabama just called and they wanna see you if you haven't done anything. So I flew home and there were seven coaches waiting for me at the, uh, airport and uh, I didn't know what, I didn't have any idea what was going on and they were all real hospitable, real sweet, real nice and everything, you know, and said, hey, uh, could you go see Coach Bryant right now? And I said, sure. And uh, uh, did not know what to expect and I met a, met a coach who apologized to me. Coach Bryant apologized to me, which was, you know, pretty uh, awe-inspiring as far as a guy like me who'd never, uh, never, uh, even been looked at by Alabama and had never dreamed of going to Alabama. And uh, what had happened is Coach Bryant, you know, we're all talking about the different things that uh, made him a great coach. Uh, he was watching film of some of his uh, top offensive line prospects, I think is what happened. And he was watching uh, their number one offensive line prospect. And we had played against this guy's team in the playoffs. And I had a good game against him. And uh, uh, that's how I got my scholarship. But I, I think that says a lot for Coach Brian as far as, you know, what, he was also a very well-organized, prepared, hardworking man. And uh, he had caught me on film, and I was in the right place at the right time. And, uh, you know, then obviously I went on to uh, play at sure. University of Alabama. Did it ever get, come to the point where you decided you were going to quit? <laughs> <laughs> you would ask that question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, being a guy that... Uh, I mean, you know, Jeremiah, you talking about the things that we learn when we come to Alabama. I probably am as as good example of, uh, uh, is as good an example as anybody, of somebody that came here as a, not just a boy. I wasn't a punk, but I I, I definitely wasn't a man when I came here. And um, Coach uh, Griska, was Coach Griska around, Coach Griska and the uh, off uh, the. Back then we had freshman teams. I was an offensive lineman as a freshman. I asked them to move me to defense and uh, for the spring and they moved me to defense. I um, moved my way up and became the number two tackle, which meant I was a starter. As back then, that's the way Coach Bryant uh, rated folks, I think one, two, three, four at each position. And so I thought I had arrived, had a good spring game and uh, didn't do much between spring and fall and came back and uh, uh, never forget it. Old Willie, Old Willie Meadows gave me my basket, and it wasn't brown. Back then it was orange or yellow or whatever the heck it was. But I, I was expecting to be a starter, and I was like number 23 on the list. And uh, what had happened is I had not prepared to come back, uh, I had not prepared properly to come back in great shape, and uh, Coach Bryant knew it. And after the third practice, I said, uh, hey, I don't need this stuff. I was a starter last spring, and uh, I'll, go some, I'll go anywhere and play. And uh, uh, what happened next really changed my life. Uh, I quit through my basket at Willie and, and walked out and got a phone call. That was during two days. Got a phone call that afternoon, and they said, Coach Bryant wanted to see me in his office. And like, like you, Barry, with your meeting, and and Kenny, and I don't know how many of y'all had your meetings in Coach Bryant's office, but I said, I, I uh, went up there and he wanted my dad to go with me. So me and my, my father and myself went up there and um, long story short, he was very gracious to my dad, welcomed him in, looked at me and said, what the hell are you doing here? And I uh, really didn't know what to, uh, what to say, but he, he basically pretty much put me on my heels. I was all ready for a speech like you were, Barry. And um, I said, well, I heard you want to talk to me. He said, well, I don't like talking to quitters, but since you're here, come on in, sit your butt down. And um, <laughs> yeah, but, but what happened in that meeting, y'all, uh, he changed my life because before I came to the University of Alabama, I didn't care about being the best. I didn't care about being part of a team. There was no commitment from me to be the best I could be for my teammates. And what Coach Bryant did in that meeting is went down 22, he went over, he went down the list of 22 players on what they had done to make themselves better from spring 
to fall. He knew every one of those guys had done. Bill Henderson had lost 40 pounds. This guy had done that, that guy had done that. And pretty much told me that I didn't deserve to be a starter. And by the end of that meeting, I begged for a chance to come back and Coach Donahue, Coach Bryant said, Coach Donahue will probably kill you, but I'm gonna give you a shot. And like uh, somebody else was saying, Coach Bryant would give you a second chance. He gave me a second chance. And, uh, you know, I went on to earn a starting position, went and played Miami, and, and uh, everything I do today, every, every success that I have, every win that I have, in my opinion, came from that meeting and the fact that Coach Bryant cared enough about me, first of all, to talk to me, secondly, to turn the light on for me so that I, in that meeting, start thinking like a man instead of a punk boy. And uh, it's funny how many of our stories here tonight have, have been similar like that, you know. And, um, yeah, I did quit, and I still think about if he did not make that call, you know, it would have been woulda, shoulda, coulda, and I'd be a quitter saying, yeah, I could have done this, I could have done that. And, and I give him all the credit in the world, of course, with Coach Donahue and Coach, Henne, Co Coach Hennessy, Coach Rutledge, that like. But uh, it's one of those stories, you know, story. that, that are so, there's so many of them. Yeah. Dwight, how about you? Biggest game, most important game you've played in? Uh, okay. it was, it's a memorable moments. I mean, I remember we, uh, we were playing Tennessee. I think it was my senior year. And uh, we were playing them in Birmingham. And they might not have been that good a football team, but uh, before we knew it, <laughs> we had felt falling behind. We were 17 and nothing going into the half, going into halftime. And I think we were all stunned because I think we took them, took them a little bit for granted. And, uh, and McNeil was on the bus, and, uh, and I think uh, he was singing or something, and Coach Donahue didn't appreciate it too much. He said, you need to take this game seriously. And McNeil, <laughs> McNeil said something, oh, we're going to beat those guys. And before we knew it, at halftime, I think we, we were all stunned, and we sat back on the hill. We were down 17-0. And uh, went into the locker room, and Coach Bryant, you know, we broke up offense, defense, then we got together. Uh, as a team, and Coach Bryant said, look, we are not going to go out here and try to do this thing the easy way, throw this football up and down the field and try to get lucky. We're going to do this thing the sure way, and that's the hard way. He said, we're going to go out there, we're going to run the football. And he said, the defense is going to stop, and we did exactly, exactly that. We went back out there, we scored 24 points, and uh, defense never allowed them to score, score another game and stuff. So that, that kind of thing helps me, you know, being a part of that sort of thing helps me still in life and that sort of thing, you know. And like Leroy and up you in business, you bring up, you know, out here it's not easy. Uh, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And you got to go through those times, and it's a process. And uh, so that game right there kind of helps me uh, still today and that sort of thing. So, Leroy, how about you? Biggest game of all the great ones you've been in? Well, You know, you, you'd look at the ones individually. Uh, the Oklahoma Bowl game was a big game for me individually because I, I got credit for a lot of tackles, you know. Uh, had a lot of guys knocking blockers off of me where I couldn't make them. But, uh, uh, you know, the Tennessee and the Auburn games were always big. You know, his, his theory was you don't beat Tennessee, you don't have a good year or you don't have a great year. Because you got to beat them to, to, to be undefeated to get into the Auburn and, and later games. If you don't beat them in, what, second, third week of October every year back then, uh, man, you don't have a great season. And he pointed toward that uh, every year for us. And I think the Tennessee games were always tremendous. Uh, you know, I, I look back and wish we'd had a stadium big enough uh, then to play them in Tuscaloosa instead of yeah. Birmingham. And it's so exciting now seeing the big games being played in Tuscaloosa. Uh, I wasn't for that to begin with, but uh, but I see that it's been a real, real win deal for us. Uh, I didn't like it because it helped Auburn so damn much. So I, I think that's what irritated me so much. But, uh, but uh, you know, yeah, that Orange Bowl game was a great game for uh, for me and the, and the team. Hey, Van, talk, clearly we know the biggest game. We talked about it earlier, but... Give everybody the lowdown, not so much the guys in the studio, but the, the fans who are watching, the interaction between place kicker and the others on the roster. Uh, you know, you always hear these stories that you guys are in your own little cocoon, your own little world, off on the corner of the practice field. Uh, did you, do you feel part of the team when you don't have to make that big kick? It, how, how does that interplay go? 
Well, there, you know, there is a difference there. Uh, obviously, the place kickers are not out on the practice field every day and, you know, getting roughed up and putting forth, uh, burning the energy that the other guys are. But, uh, you know, when I played, I always kicked throughout the entire course of the practice. And also in the off season, we also participate in the same manner, the same uh, running, the same lifting as everybody else. So that, that helped, um, you know, at least, at least that allowed the other players to respect the kickers. And that was something that Coach Perkins demanded. Mm -hmm. You know, he demanded that we do exactly what everybody else did <clears throat> outside of, you know, the actual physical portion of it. As you know, if you get your kicker a broke leg, he's not a whole lot of good to you. So <laughs> um, that, that was sort of the relationship we had there. And I think, I feel like everybody had to respect that to some degree. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, if I think if... Of course, if we had just uh, gone out and practice and got there 30 minutes early, warmed up, kicked with special teams, and wandered off for the day, you know, I don't, you know, that would just been pulling things farther apart. So that's the way Coach Perkins did it, and I, I think that was the right way to do it. Wes, how about you? Is there a single biggest memory? Well, of course, you know, yeah. third and 12 with 31 seconds, you know, yeah, at the 12, strong. third and 18 from the 12. But I think what we did to Tennessee uh, my senior year, uh, we ran uh, the same play 48 times. Yeah. And uh, Bobby, who was here earlier, uh, I think we had three backs over 200 yards, and they came out with their orange shoes, and you know, and I think we'll, the final score. Uh, we threw the ball six times the whole game. Yeah. <laughs> 15 and, uh, 28, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we, so we threw the ball six times, four for touchdowns. And, uh, I mean, one time we lined up, and, and uh, we'd run the sweep so many times. We look out, there was nobody in front of us, and we look out there, and everybody was on the right. <laughs> and I think, actually, my roommate, Bill Conan, checked off. He said, he looked up at shoe and said, we can't go there. <laughs> and we ran up the middle for a touchdown. So I, I think that was, uh, other than the Auburn game, when we came back, that was my greatest memory. What about the, what about the one, the Georgia game? Yeah. That was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was they huge. danced a little bit too much that night. They forgot there was time <laughs> on the clock. The defense came out there. They were dead. They couldn't rush the passer. And Mike brought us back. That's, that's one thing. I think we're in good hands with Mike Shula. Yeah. I mean, if anybody was in the huddle with him in those games when it just looked, you know, as bleak as it could be, and you, you looking at his eyes and you just believed, you know, that they weren't going to get to the, they weren't going to get to him because if they got to him, he wasn't going to get away. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fact to fact. Jake, not counting the championship game, was it the Georgia night that you and Zaire went head to head or what? No, uh, definitely. And uh, for me, it, <clears throat> an amazing night because uh, I was struggling early on. Actually, the greatest game of my life, and it's amazing how God works because it seemed like from the whole time I was in my career at Alabama, I was being humbled. And uh, that night I got benched. I got benched for a series. Brian Burdorf went in for a series. Coach Stallings said, you need to sit over here and watch. You need to get your act together, and you need to see things clearly. And I was disappointed because at first, I'd just come back from a knee injury. I thought, I'm not going to see another down. I really thought that I might, that Brian's going to go out there because Brian was very talented, and I thought he might just take this thing over and go. Um, but after that, came back in and um, just, you know, they told me a week before, they said, you know, Eric's going to throw for 300 yards. You're going to maybe throw for 100. Uh, but I said, look, you know, as long as we win the game, and, you know, ended up throwing for 396 yards and a couple touchdowns, and uh, that, was, that was a special night. But the greatest thing about it was, and you know this, is I got to share my faith on ESPN National TV. And uh, that meant more than anything to me. I, and the guys in this room that share the same thing that I, that I have experienced in life is that it's really neat. Two of the, the greatest thing that ever happened to me happened because of crimson blood, uh, blood that was shed for me, that I would have a relationship with my Savior, and then the crimson tide. And I say... My, my wife and my kids come before that, you know, after, after, after my uh, faith. But uh, it's, uh, Crimson has been special to me in many ways. Mm -hmm. Kevin, how about you? Oh, it's uh, very special games. I, I was uh, fortunate and I guess unfortunate to be a part of the first uh, Auburn-Alabama game down there in Auburn. And uh, we had such a talented team. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, that game still haunts me. Uh, it really does. But... Uh, one of the games I had the most fun in that probably no one, uh, no one's ever seen was the uh, Ole Miss game. 
Yeah, that was over, quite over a, there at Ole Miss. Bama's down 21 nothing. Down 21 nothing before uh, I had, had people tell me, you know, before they even got the radio on good. Oh, it was unbelievable. Know, we're down 21 nothing, and, uh, and, and what a fun game. Gary Hollingsworth comes, I mean, throws for five touchdowns that game. Ran off like come 50 back. or 60 points in a row. Oh, it was, it was uh, I think it was 62 unanswered 62, points. Yeah. Beat them 62 to 21 or yeah, something. Unbelievable. <laughs> it was. But yeah, you sit down. The game wasn't seven minutes yeah. old. You're down yeah. 21 First nothing. You look around. Uh, at right. junior college, listen to it, going to the game, <laughs> and it was 21 to zero. We just just got on the bus. <laughs> well, I tell you what's funny about that is Curry. You know, he goes, I could look in their eyes and I could tell we were going to come back, and we're down twenty-one nothing. I said, I was staring at the bus, and if we can get on. <laughs> I was like, Holy mackerel! What the hell? But we came back so fast. By the end of the first quarter, it was twenty-eight twenty-one, and then halftime it was fifty-three to twenty-one or something. And it's amazing how we just came back so fast with that. And another one that year, you can talk about the the two. Uh, goal line stands against uh, Penn, yeah, State. Penn State. You know we're up Thomas there. Thomas Rams deal. We're up there. You know it's the ball's on uh, that far from the goal line. I mean Paterno must have nightmares over it. Yeah. Uh, so he finally, you know, this time we're going to kick it. All we got to do is kick it. We don't have to score. And then did we block yeah, the Ray kick? Ray Tarasi kicks it and Ram. I got kissed by Jerry Duncan that day. <laughs> <laughs> I love listening. I got a tape of that call. I guess it, it was worth I getting the win. I got a tape of that call. But awesome. uh, you don't want to get kissed by Jerry Duncan. <laughs> Not <laughs> Just... sober, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Lamont, how about yourself? Some special memory. Well, I think uh, Kevin just took uh, my two because we played together. And uh, everybody seems to always say the fondest memories are the games they won. But uh, one of the most memorable games was the first time we went down to Auburn in 89. Even though we lost the game, it was such a big deal to them. I mean, there was just seas of blue and orange as we were riding the bus, and they were rocking the bus and patting on it. And, you know, I was just a little country boy from Aniana. I was standing up looking out the window and <laughs> said, look at those people, you know. And then just the adrenaline rush that you got. And uh, we were going into the game just mo newly number two in the country, 10 and 0. And, of course, they ended up beating us. But even though we lost, that's one of the most memorable. And then I can remember that, that block field goal at Penn State. I can remember as a kid, used to watch uh, the wonderful wide world of sports. And I can remember taking my helmet off because the play before that, I think the running back's name was Blair Thomas. Yeah, was he it? missed the goal. He had carried all the way up the all field. All the way up the field. Yeah. And on the play, he was second down. He was running so low to the ground, nobody really even touched him. He just fell on the inch yard line. And so they decided to kick the field goal on third down. And I took my helmet off and got down on one knee. And I said, man, I've seen all these miraculous finishes on the wide world of sports. How come it can't happen to us? <laughs> and about that time, I heard two thumps, and we blocked it. And Got a 15-yard penalty for celebrating, but you know, the game, right. was, over the game was over then. Yeah. Deuce, how about yourself? Well, my, fr my game is the Tennessee game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably one of the first games I told Jay to throw me the ball. Don't throw it to anyone else but me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Did he say that? Well, he came back to the huddle and he said, uh, we're playing too deep. He said, just rear back and throw right, right off the corners back, and I promise you I'm going to catch it. And I did. I just came back, rear back and threw it, and that little man just jumps out <laughs> and grabs it. But he kept coming back to hell. He goes, just throw it to me. Just throw it to me. That's one of my favorite games. Uh, we were down. We were about a minute, minute and 40 seconds left in the game, and we were backed up to our 20, maybe 15-yard line. And uh, we all stuck together that game. The offense, you know, defense carried us the whole, whole while I've been here. But the offense... We stood up that game, and first, we didn't lose to Tennessee. I'm probably the, uh, one of the guys that never lost to Tennessee. Amen to that. Yeah. I remember Rod Rogers uh, made the statement after his senior year, my junior year, we had swept, uh, beat Tennessee again, I guess for the fifth or sixth time, and uh, Roger had it in the paper. I, I still had to play him again next year, but... We all have to pay property tax in Tennessee because we own them. Yeah, on these <laughs> Thank you very much. And then Taylor tried to steal it from me. <laughs> He's getting credit for it. Yeah. But you know, that's another thing about we talked about Lee Corso earlier. It was it was a not, it was a later game, so you get oh, to sit yeah. around and watch college football. And Corso saying, "Well, a high school team could beat Alabama." We started off 0 and 3, and by the way, the only 0 and 3 team to finish with a winning record at Alabama. But. <laughs> That's not <laughs> dubious distinction. It's not very good amongst this group, um, and, and and you know that gets you fired up. Of course, Philip Doyle has a game-winning kick. Uh, you know it's funny how Stacy Harrison blocks their field goal, and it ricochets off his helmet and rolls 30 yards the other way because we really hadn't moved the ball Thank much that game. Had a big head. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that size nine yeah. helmet is. That was the and, longest play we had from scrimmage. <laughs> <that. laughs> block <laughs> kick. 
And uh, and then so we go in and do it. And then afterwards, you know, just the emotion of the game. And I just said, you know, we ought to pay, pay property tax on Neyland Stadium because we own it. And Stallings comes up to me and goes, hey, man, why did you see that? Man? We got to <laughs> play those gotta get guys the, gotta again. Get the and I said, coach, I ain't got to play them again. <laughs> I'm done. But it was, uh, you know, all those Tennessee games are always oh, special. Yeah, and of course, special. the one down at, at Auburn in, in uh, 89 was it's just different, a different atmosphere, which the outcome would have been a little bit better. But, you know, we talked about motivation earlier and how you, Coach Bryant motivated, Coach Curry motivated by he pulled us in the room. I've told this story before. And he gives us a cassette tape. And on that cassette tape is Whitney Houston singing One Moment in Time. <laughs> <laughs> I am not kidding. And I'm thinking, how in the world is this going to motivate us? And we had to sit and listen to it. And then he goes, make sure you hand your tapes in because we don't want any NCAA violations. <laughs> so I said, that ain't going to motivate anybody. And I thought, oh, my goodness. You know, and, and just <laughs> to listen to on the bus ride yeah, down. Yeah, we had to listen to that. Up. <laughs> and this is the way they treated us when we got down to, you know, security was high. There was a, supposedly a, a death threat on one of the players. I mean, it's a second-string guard. Well, shoot him. He ain't worth crap anyway. <laughs> I mean, that's like having one of, you know, death threat. I mean, it wasn't like they were going after Gary Hollingsworth. It was a second string dog. But really, you know, because we used to go out of our rooms and play cards and do all that kind of mess. They, would, they made us stay in our rooms with our roommates, and we couldn't intermingle. And the, 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 that part of the game, and I think we'd have won the game if we hadn't had to worry about all the other... They, how they treat it just differently. You know, if they treat it like the same. like the comedy club all of a sudden. Yeah. He'll be here all week. Remember your waiters and waiters. waiting all day to talk. <laughs> your big, we talked about the hit on Burline. Uh, biggest game in your career, Biscuit? The Tennessee game in Tennessee, my, my last year. I lost to Tennessee the three previous years. And I was in Tennessee in 82 when Tennessee beat, beat us up there. I was on a recruiting trip at Tennessee. And I remember being in that stadium up there in Tennessee on my recruiting trip up there. And in the Tennessee locker room, they were passing out cigars and you had the oranges, throwing the oranges at the Alabama players walking off the field. And at the time, I knew I was going to come to the university. But, you know, just taking a recruiting trip just to go up there, just to get out of state of Alabama for the first time, really. Uh, I'm up there and, and boy, I just, that just stuck with me. And, and then to get here and to lose to them three years in a row, and to go up there and to beat them the way we did. I mean, and uh, I think everybody that played that day probably had their best game of their careers up there. I, you know, uh, the offense just ran over them on defense. I made every play that a linebacker could make a sack, or ran down a, a guy that ran a 4 2 forward in a, on the reverse, and, you know, from sideline to sideline that game. And just to walk out of that stadium on the opposite side of it. Uh, and remember that 82 game, it was just um, a, a great feeling. Kenny, for yourself. Oh, gosh, I think any time you beat Auburn, you know, you come, up, uh, you come up through the ranks of hearing about the Alabama and Auburn rivalry, and, you know, you walk in those footsteps of uh, Mr. Gilmer and Joe and Pat Trammell and Steve Sloan and all those guys. And, you know, you got to beat Auburn, as simple as that. And I guess my senior year, the run in the mud deal, you know. And what was kind of interesting about that is before the game, worst weather, you know, you play 15 years of pro football, but that's the worst weather that I've ever played in. I mean, the field, con field conditions were, you know, it's six inches deep in mud and water, and it's real, real windy. If you look at old pictures, it had umbrellas were turned inside out. It was blowing like hell. Before the game, Coach Bryant says, we're not going to throw the ball. We're going to go out there and we're going to run the ball and try to control the line of scrimmage and we're going, to, we're going to play for field position. Auburn will screw up the kicking game. He said that Auburn will screw up the kicking game. When they do that, we'll get our field position and we'll try to do something. And just as he said, just as it would be, if you look back at that game, I think they muffed two field goal snaps. They muffed two punt snaps. The last one over Tommy Lunchford's head gave us the ball on, I think, our own 43, our own 47. And then we ran the option play and scored. But if you look, look back on that, everything that Coach Bryant said prior to the game, it happened just that way. They pushed us around all day. We only throw the ball five times. We didn't gain many yards. They went up and down the field inside the 20s, up and down the field inside the 20s. They got down in there to kick the ball, field goal, punt. They screwed up the kicking game, gave us our opportunity. And just as Coach Bryant said, and we run the option and I was telling Gary our, our system back then was so simple our formation when you when you drive a mule this is coach Bryant 
When you drive a mule and you want the mule to turn left, you say haw, H-A-W. If you want the mule to go right, you say G, G double E. Well, our formations was G was our right, haw was our left, and that play was so simple. It was G, fullback motion. We put the fullback in one step motion to get him out front, and then you take the ball and go right down the line of scrimmage and option the guy at the end of the line of scrimmage. G, fullback motion right, quarterback option right. That's a simple, simple play. Then we run the option, and they jump on the pitch guy and make me keep it, and Dennis Holman comes in and hits the strong safety and turns him ass over T. Kettle. <laughs> and, then we, and then we get down the sidelines and you, and, you, and you just run till you hit that chain link fence. <laughs> Gary, how about yourself? Well, I was, I was part of the, uh, I was backup quarterback in 72 against Auburn. And if everybody knows about that, they blocked our kicks and beat us 17-16. So that upset the coaches pretty bad. Coach Bryant, we were all upset. So. The next year in 73, we, you know, we go 10-0 uh, at the time. We're, we're playing Auburn, and this means something to the coaches and uh, to Coach Bryant. I mean, you can just see it in the preparation that week before. So, um, you know, then we beat them 35 to nothing. And I remember, uh, you know, the, when they beat us, you know, all the bumper stickers said, uh, you know, punt, bam, a punt. Well, after that, 35 to nothing whipping we gave him was score, Auburn score. <laughs> so that was not my best career game, but it was my most satisfying sure. win. John, how about yourself? Well, that's part of that 72 game is a bad memory. And uh, the thing I remember most about that game, though, was Coach Bryant coming in after the game and apologizing for losing the game. Because um, anybody that knows about that game realizes that we marched the ball down twice and scored immediately. And the whole rest of the game, he didn't run outside the tackles. So they stacked 15 guys, you know, he just stacked everybody there and he just wouldn't run outside. So he left the offense to do, you know, basically he just, he says, don't worry about it, they'll never run the ball. And they didn't, they only got 80 yards for the whole total offense the whole day, that's all they got. But, you know, it just shows you gotta, you gotta, you know, offense has got to score points. You know, it's not, it's not a defensive game. If defense will get you there, but offense has got to win it. And um, so that, that's a memorable game, and I got a little bit of bitterness about that one. But I think the most satisfying game was uh, when I came to Alabama, it, it had been after a real kind of a bad time in Alabama. Uh, there a lot of losing seasons. Uh, and at Alabama, losing seasons means six and four. Um, yeah. uh, 69, 70. So we'd gone out and we, before we played Southern Cal, we put in a wishbone offense. And we'd go out to Southern Cal and we'd go out and, and beat them after they'd beaten us 46 to something the year before. And we went out and beat them, beat the same team. And with a whole new offense in three weeks. And the most satisfying picture I've ever seen is, uh, and I still to this day, is this, there's a picture of that line of scrimmage, and our offensive line is coming off the ball low. We've already taken our first step, and Southern Cal's defensive line hadn't even lifted their hand off the ground yet. And that was, to me, that was the most satisfying victory of my career. But the most disappointing thing was that Auburn game, because, and the other thing that hurt too was, you know, in that Auburn game, Coach Bryant told Gantz, get back there and just take one step and kick it and don't worry about it. And, um, so Gant gets moves up five yards behind the center like or 10 yards like the coach had told him to. And instead of taking no steps, he took four steps. <laughs> so he's like three yards behind the center when he finally kicked the ball. Remember that? So, you know, that, that's just, it's just not, but I haven't thought about it much since then. <laughs> You know, hadn't, hadn't bothered me a bit. <laughs> hey, hey, Leroy, you know, I guess there's darn near every NFL team representing in this studio. Somebody's played everywhere. You've played, though, for arguably the most prominent collegiate team and arguably the most prominent NFL team. Similarities with the head coaches, with the organization. Uh, were there similarities? Were there extreme differences? Uh, there were extreme differences, but there were some similarities. Uh, both of them were good organizers. Both of them, uh, uh, you know, loved to recruit the type people 
that would win for you and play for you every day and that they could motivate. Uh, Coach Landry was not near the uh, motivator or, or, or the guy who could excite you about playing the game. He was he felt like you were a professional and you you were paid to play the game and everybody should play at the level he worked at, which we know that doesn't happen for everybody. You know, some some people have to have some little extra help. And uh, but Coach Landry uh, was was a brilliant guy. He could he could coach just as well on the defensive side as he could the offensive side. So it was amazing. But uh, Coach Bryant's still a, the one I remember most, and his you know his just the way he taught us and motivated us and conditioned us into believing that we could win at the uh, at any point in the game. You down the uh, Georgia Tech game, we were down 15 to nothing, similar game that you guys have had before. And he come in there and we all got, we kept our chin strap buckle, man. We didn't know what was big to happen, you know? We, we, we were really scared. And man, we had a, we had a uh, kind of a, a TV or, or, or movie theater type setting. It rose one up, you know, and God, he comes in there and says, Guys, we got them right where we want them. Said so we gonna get them. Said y'all relax. Get these boys some drinks here. Get some cokes in here. You know, get everybody to settle down here. Offense, get over here. Defense, get over here. Everybody took their helmet and uh, unbuckled their chin trap. Took their helmet off. Everybody waited till the end to do that. We went back and beat them 16 to 15 and uh, uh, kicked their butts the second half. And uh, you know, just the way he was, he just had a knack of uh, of what to do when. And sometimes it was shout and scream and yell and then there was those times where he knew how to read the team and knew what they needed you know and he just uh you know the i, I tell people i said you know i had 14 years with coach landry and it was terrific and we had some great seasons but uh had four years with coach brian and uh, whew, uh that that four years overshadows that 14. <laughs> that's the way i feel about it i played in i played in that game with leroy and uh but you talk about coach brian being a motivator and he wanted to win against Tennessee for so many coaches. He, had to, he, you know, he wanted to win all, but he, he liked to win against Tennessee. And he, it is, a lot of his talks over the years were a lot of the same, even though they were different everything he said. But I remember when, the, when the, uh, uh, Conscious Holloway was a senior, Steve Bechea was our fullback, and he made the last play right to the very end of the game. We came behind and won. But see, it's like we talked about. Coach Brown started that game. He said, today we become one. If you don't feel that way, you don't belong here. When Steve runs, we run. When John blocks, we block. Now remember this. The game is over. You come back in the shower. You walk by the mirror. And only you and the man in that mirror knows if you did the best you could, you walk out of the dressing room. You see your girlfriend. You hug your mama. And you reach out. You touch your daddy's hand. And only you and the man knows if you did the best you could. Yeah. We heard that one. And I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. We are, we are six minutes from wrapping up, and there'd be no better way to end the tape than with that. So, gentlemen, we are adjourned. Thank you so much. I'm Larry Black, executive producer of the Legends of Alabama Football. I grew up in Alabama during the Paul Bear Bryant years, so this has been a special treat to be able to bring you this series. I hope you've enjoyed it and will treasure it for years to come. If you have any questions or want to contact me, check out our website at www.sportsreunion.com or call our Nashville office at 615-673-2846. Thanks for watching and God bless you.